Hello and welcome. I'm excited to introduce you to my guest tonight. Lonnie Dupree is back with me. He was on about four or five years ago already. And um, he's back to talk more about his Denali climb. Um, many of you know who follow the world of exploring and, and adventure that he climbed solo in January uh, Denali and was the first person to have done that. Um, 20,340 feet, right? And um, yeah. as I told Lonnie, I've been reading about that climb in a book called Alone at the Top. And I practically feel it so well written that I was climbing it too. So I'm full of questions for him. <laughs> We're going to talk too about one of his passions, which is educating people about climate change and the warming of the Arctic and he knows more about it than probably almost anyone in our country. He's um, conferred and worked some with Greenpeace and National Geographic and the, um, some of the government offices too. Um, yep. And so we'll learn more about his thoughts on climate change. We're also going to talk about some of his other expeditions. Um, He's won so many awards, but I just want to mention a couple of them. Um, I thought your Rolex award seemed like a really big, big deal. And tell well, us what that was, Yeah, Lonnie. well, the Rolex Awards for Enterprise was about, um, about our One World uh, expedition to go to the North Pole in the summertime to bring attention to climate change and what was going on with the Arctic Ocean sea ice up there at that time. And uh, Rolex really liked our proposal on that. And um, we were one of uh, six people that were chosen out of, uh, I think, 1,500 applicants. Wow. And so um, um, it allowed us some um, um, substantial seed money to get that project off the ground and uh, to conduct some science while we were there. And um, basically pull and paddle and push whitewater canoes from Ellesmere Island, Canada to the North Pole. And that was in 2006? 2006, One yes. of your, your, your expeditions up there. You also were the first person, and with another man, to circumvent Greenland. Yes. And that was a huge... <laughs> Um, yeah, Greenland, uh, Mary was, uh, they call it an island, but I, I think it's a continent, you know, after you try to go all the way it's around huge. it. It's huge. So it's uh, 6,500 miles all the way around. And we did the whole southern part of Greenland by kayak and the whole northern part uh, by dog, dog team. And um, it took us from 1997 to 2001. And you to hadn't actually realized it would take that long, right? No, we had no idea it would take us that long um, because Greenland is a very complex place. Uh, so you're, it only really allows you to travel there, whether you're kayaking or dog sledding, during certain times of the year. And the rest of the time is, is pretty fierce and pretty difficult to kayak, unsafe to kayak, or uh, uh, not safe to dog sled either. So there's some periods where you have to wait and mm -hmm. wait out the weather, whether it's the light coming back or the storms to cease in the ocean and things like that, or the ice to break up or to form. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it made the expedition over five years, uh, actually. So that was a big, big hunk of your, your exploring life. And Denali, this successful solo ascent was a fourth try. And so again, that took up on a hunk of time, didn't it? Yeah, I often have to be that. careful what kind of expedition I decide to chew off, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it could take up a good part of my life, uh, like Greenland. Um, and Denali, um, it, it, it took four tries before I could make it to the top of that mountain because the conditions are so um, unstable. The weather conditions are so unstable mm -hmm. that it may let you get a certain ways in a certain amount of time mm -hmm. in a year, or it might not let you go at all. And or you cannot control that. You have no way of controlling yeah. uh, the weather. And Denali is really home to some of the most uh, unstable and, and fierce weather that I've ever been in uh, because it's 
the, the, the mountain is actually right on the base of the Bering Sea mm -hmm. uh, and the Gulf of Alaska. And so... So the winds can get up to what? 80 miles per hour Yeah, sometimes. the winds can get uh, 80 miles an hour. And then in the winter months, uh, not only does darkness uh, come over the mountain, but also the, uh, the jet stream drops down um, oh. over the mountain, so the winds accelerate. Ooh. So um, the higher you go up in the mountain, the higher the wind speeds will be. So I'm sure some of the people sitting at home right now are saying, so Lonnie, why did you want to do it in the winter? I mean, wouldn't it be good enough to do it in the summertime? Uh, yeah, um, I think what helped me with Denali in winter is my background of being a polar explorer. So, uh, my You're not afraid of cold, are you? Yeah, so the uh, expeditions we did to the North Pole, uh, the, the rounding of Greenland, the dog setting across Canada's Northwest Passage, all of those expedition had, expeditions had extreme cold or periods of dark in there mm -hmm. and, and uh, between that and incorporating techniques that I learned from the Polar Inuit people on staying warm, surviving, navigating, those kind of things uh, helped me on Denali. So you weren't put off by the, the cold part of it? No, I actually mm -hmm. uh, treated the climb like a polar expedition and not like a climb. Hmm. How yeah. do you explain that a little yeah. bit more? Well, I looked at it as um, um, I would just use the same techniques for staying alive in the cold as I would in the North Pole. Um, mm -hmm. I would have to develop uh, some techniques for climbing, of course, since it is a mountain. Different kind of boots. Different kind of boots, mm -hmm. uh, different kind of food, too. Right. A little bit different food, a um, little bit different clothing, that kind of stuff. Uh, so that all had to be learned. Um, so, um, uh, going, uh, so I, I, tried, I treated it like a polar expedition, but um, um, spent uh, all my available time really uh, getting my head wrapped around mountaineering and the techniques right. and that around that. Shift. And that it's shift. A big shift. Yeah. I mean, in the beginning, it sounded like you took you and uh, your two buddies who went up. Yeah. First, before you did the solo, yeah. you took a one-day crash course on climbing Den yeah. Denali or something. I thought, <laughs> yeah, that's um, some yeah. <laughs> brief, so, brief course. A couple of my uh, uh, good friends, uh, Tom and Buck from Grand Marais, Minnesota, we uh, decided to, uh, we've been moping around Grand Marais for a while <laughs> and think, thought it was time to be on an adventure. We were exciting. all going through our midlife crisis of various sorts, uh, and so we decided to get out of town and... <laughs> and go try to climb uh, Denali, and I and Buck had done a lot, a little bit of climbing, and and Tom was an adventure athlete, and um, my background in exploration. So I figured, well, I could, I Pretty could handle partners. the camping part well, mm -hmm. and the travel part, and that kind of stuff. And when we get to the mountain, we're just going to have to use our heads and 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 and. We, uh, try to be safe out there. We took a little crash course on uh, mountaineering, and uh, that mixed with some common sense. Uh, we hope we had. <laughs> we left, and we figured, well, yeah. we could. If we get too scared or it gets too hard or we're too we tired, we'll just turn, turn around. around. And at one point, you guys separated, and I thought, oh boy, this is dangerous sounding. When you you went off on your own, didn't you? Yeah, we were uh, three of us. We were standing at 18,000 feet. We were all tired. And uh, Buck and Tom were uh, still wanting to go to the summit. They were pretty tired. Mm -hmm. I, I still wanted to go. Uh, but uh, they wanted to unrope at that point. And, and they the wanted three to of take, you were roped. Three of us were roped together. Mm -hmm. And um, so we unroped. And uh, the, the, uh, I, I went on my, by myself, and uh, a couple hours later, I got to the summit myself. And on my way back down, I ran into Buck and Tom go on their way going up, a little bit slow. And I said, well, I'll wait for you yeah. down at the uh, football field. They call it the football <laughs> field. It's a little flat spot yeah. Yeah. up there and, uh, for you to come back down. And um, it took them a long time. To I get remember back down, you said I you were sort of pacing around I for a couple hours. I paced around. I was hours. wondering if, we should, uh, if I should dig in and make camp right, for us because right. um, most expeditions take about 
12 hours to do the round trip from high camp, 17,000 to the summit and back. We, were, we took 19 hours. Mm. So uh, it took an extra long. So um, see um, the difference again. What was the first number? A uh, typical mountaineer uh, uh, mountaineering team can get to the summit and back down to high camp, which right. is at seventeen thousand right. in twelve hours. With twelve, and you took nineteen. And we took nineteen. That's the three a of big us difference. Because we're all am we were all amateurs, um, but stubborn amateurs, <laughs> and uh, but we also knew that um, we needed to be very safe in our footing. And we took an extra amount of time uh, in all those details coming down. Although we were very exhausted by the time we got back yeah, down. I bet. Yeah. When you did it solo, Lonnie, one of the things that seemed the most frightening to me was when you did, at, at, toward the very end, that really um, steep vertical climb with just getting your toes and crampons in the, the rock. Can you describe that a bit? Yeah, I, mean, that I was, was uh, so I'm standing at uh, on the football field looking at the summit and I got to make a determination how to get there. And I couldn't quite remember how Buck and I <laughs> and Tom did it. Uh -huh. And I know the standard route tends to go a little bit more to the right, but I couldn't get myself to go there. Um, I, it looked better straight ahead. And I knew I could maybe get myself in a little trouble going more directly to the summit because it's steeper and there's some avalanche train, uh, terrain there. Uh, but I went anyways. I was running short on time. And um, I went, and it was very steep at the end. I had about a 20-foot section where I had to, I wish I had two axes and I only had one, yeah. uh, but took my so time. So you throw the axe Yeah, it was in. pretty vertical. It's about uh, 70 to 80 degree uh, That's slant, pretty vertical. Right at, the, right at the very last 20 feet going up this particular section. Um, whereas going around the other way, you're, uh, you're only looking at uh, angles of about 40 to 50 per degrees. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I did come, come back down that way on the, the way the out. The safer way. The safer way. Oh, that was smart. So I took the most direct way to get there and then took the safer way down. Another part that seemed really... Um, awful to me in a way was when you got snowed in at 11,200 yeah. feet. Yeah. And was it seven, six or seven days? Yeah, I was, uh, I was stuck uh, there, that particular location for five days, but I was stuck there with only a day and a half of food and three days of fuel. Yeah. So I had to stretch a day and a half worth of food for five days and then really stretch my fuel too because yeah. when you're out of when you run out of fuel that means you run out of things to drink and when you run out of things to drink you're going to get dehydrated in a very short amount right. of time in an arid environment like that right. um, and then i was running out of calories to stay warm um, so with you were right on food. the edge so i was right on you? the head, edge i felt i had about 36 hours left before i expired but was um, that your most frightening part of that trip that was one of the most, yeah, it was. It was one, that was probably one of the most frightening times because I was actually going through my head what I was going to say yeah. to people on the satellite phone because it's not like I could get rescued because the weather's bad or um, um, uh, they couldn't come in and get me anyways. Uh, so it was really about coming to terms with, you know. Saying goodbye in a yeah, way. Yeah, saying goodbye and, mm -hmm. you know, you only have so much phone batteries and yes. who do you call first yeah and, you know, oh, all that, that kind of stuff so really I wrung my hands over part. that more than anything yeah yeah um and then there are crevasses when you're climbing mountains and you had the experience of going in one yeah. can you just briefly describe what that's like I mean that's yeah. kind of a nightmare for most of us who would yeah yeah imagine so, it so um, uh, the Alaska Range is heavily crevassed because it's just uh, uh, multiple river, uh, glacial rivers that are heavily crevassed. And uh, so everywhere you go, you could potentially fall in one of these. So how I prevent that from happening in most circumstances is I have very long skis. 
They're about that five inches made wide. With a, a friend, right? Yeah, they made birch. from tree, uh, birch trees from yeah. our property in, uh, on the North Shore of Lake Superior. And they're five inches wide and almost eight feet long. And that's to span the hidden bridges, snow bridges over the top of these crevasses and also distribute my weight so I don't break through. Yeah. And then I also have a very long aluminum pole that I attach to a hip w harness that uh, extends out in front of me and then behind me. That you're in sort case of I, dragging? Is I, that it's kind of a It's super drag? light. You hardly know it's oh, there. Oh, you don't. Okay. And so um, um, if I was to punch through with my skis, this gives me a little extra uh, length to bridge right. those uh, so broken eight snow bridges. So feet long skis sounds cumbersome to the, ski with that length of ski well, there, but yeah. <laughs> the safety thing is makes it worth it the safety is worth mm -hmm. it yeah they're they're um, uh, they're made for just shuffling and not yeah. picking up and putting down like snowshoes That's but true. shuffling There's a difference, so yeah. it's just a shuffle and it's to for safety and um, but one of the one uh, when I when you put your skis down and uh, or in camp and you're starting to climb a little bit you have to uh, probe more with your ski poles to make right. sure there's no crev crevasses in front of you. Um, and I did that on a, on a climb of Hunter uh, a couple years ago. And, but coming back down, I came back down just slightly different than where I went up. And I misplaced uh, where I was going and fell into a bush run, which is a type of crevasse that is where the ice meets solid rock of the mountain, but the ice is moving mm. and the rock is stationary and it forms a big gap there. Uh, so the how far run. down do you think you Well, went? it goes, they go a long, long ways. They, a few hundred, they could be a few oh hundred gosh. feet deep. Um, oh. And it's, uh, you know, a little wider. The one I fell in was um, about uh, four feet wide. Uh, but I just happened to punch through um, the surface, and I happened to have my ice axe in my hand, my right hand, and as I fell through and was plunging down, I had my ice axe shaft on the downhill side of the crevasse, and I managed to get it stuck into the downhill side of that crevasse uh, above the crevasse, and it stopped me from going and all it, the way so in. So it went into the ice, not the rock. Right, it went into the snow side, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And... Um, because um, the rock side wouldn't have. Well, the, when I say wouldn't. rock side, there's always snow over the oh, rock okay. too. Okay, so but, it might have. But and it would have probably plunged there. But I was, I fell, um, I was going down the mountain at the time, and that's when I plunged into this hole. Right. Um, and as I was going down, I happened to have my ice axe in the um, in the proper position for self-arresting that, fortunate. which was lucky. Yeah. And it was a lot of training from Colorado that really yeah. paid off. And I managed to bury the shaft of that ice axe into mm. the snow. And that kept me from going all the way into the crevasse. Oh, gosh. And then you described how you used your left leg to get up on the ledge. Yeah, it and seemed then like forever up. to get out because yeah. I didn't want to bust that. No. edge of that snow so I I was very gingerly wiggling around trying to get my leg up and but I first had to get the backpack off yeah. um, because I had a 30 pound backpack on on uh, over my shoulders so I had, had one to hand. while I had the uh, one axe in this hand I I inched I unbuckled and then I inched it inched it inched it over and I got it rolled off without letting go of the axe so the backpack's now laying on the outside and uh -huh. I switched hands at that point oh. let the backpack fly grab my hand again and so and the then backpack's down in the crevasse right my, now my no my backpack rolled outside the because oh, it, it was outside oh, the crevasse it was and just enough. rolled down oh, oh, okay. uh, the hill a little ways okay yeah oh so it was like, you kept <laughs> from panicking obviously but did you have to talk to yourself and how did you um, Not panic. I was, uh, my heart was racing when I got out I um, and I realized that my mindset was no longer there. So I need, I, I actually called it quits after that, 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 mm -hmm. um, went back down to camp, radioed in, I'm calling it quits. I'm coming back to base camp. Uh, because you just felt you'd 
You wasn't in had the right. Too close of a, of had too call. close of a call, mm -hmm. and I couldn't refocus. Mm -hmm. That again, makes like sense. It, so like you needed using, to using using part of your brain that was <laughs> protective, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, you have those. I was very lucky in that situation, and uh, it was time to go home and reevaluate uh, things. And it was a very it could have been a very costly learning experience yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, it's amazing kind of a thing you got out of that. Um, climate change, we don't have a whole lot of time left. I would love to have, as I said, three or four hours to yeah. pick your brain, but um, the, the Arctic is obviously warming, we know that. Yep. Um, how worried are you and, and what are your kind of observations that you think people should yeah. hear, Lani? Yeah, well, I'm very, I'm very worried and uh, because the amount of um, um, uh, the greenhouse gases we're emitting into the air each day um, without um, uh, working towards solving that um, is a big deal because in 10 years from now, uh, we might not be able to recover. That's what I remember Will said that. Will Steger said, you know, we've got 10 or 11 years. And yeah. that's such a short window. It is because, but the, the, what's happening, Mary, is that there's so much concentration of greenhouse gases now in the atmosphere and being absorbed into the oceans and stuff like that, um, that even if we stop emitting those greenhouse gases today, a lot of those gases are going to remain in the atmosphere for the next 50 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to, um, we need a, we need a um, Apollo 11 mission on mm -hmm. climate change or, mm -hmm. um, uh, or a Manhattan Some Project on climate change, focus. a major focus, mm -hmm. governmental focus on stopping climate change. And it has to start, it has to start out on a legislative level um, because that's, we need big policy changes to get things turned around. And then our government needs to act as a example for other governments to follow. Which we haven't been doing lately. Which we haven't been doing. Um, when you say legislatively, um, so what does that mean for average citizens like myself? Yes. I mean, we yeah. call our legislators, we write to them, right? Yeah. Um, you, you, vote, you vote for uh, environmentally right. sound legislators. That's right. a biggie. That's huge. Um, in our own lives, yes, we, we do whatever we can for, for the planet, downsize a little bit, um, live a little bit more simply yeah. with a little less stuff, maybe. You've written uh, about that, too, Yeah, Bridges. those kind of things. And um, uh, be as conscious that way. But it's really about getting out and uh, teaching this uh, climate change stuff in schools um, um, and, and voting for people that really care about our planet. And that's really a, the big, the, where the big step starts. Private industry is, you know, and some of the states, California, are doing some really good things yes. without our national leadership um, helping much right now. Yes. Um, does that give you hope? Uh, that, that is an excellent, they're, they're an excellent model for the rest of the United mm -hmm. States, California is. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have some fairly good policies here in Minnesota as well. Um, but we have to get um, the government working as a whole uh, to really make it happen. And um, uh, because of the fossil fuel industries are getting subsidized, right. why? I have no idea. Right. And that's those subsidies should be going to solar and right. wind right. and uh, because they need the jump start. And they, they really need the, um, uh, the, the, the governmental backing and funding. So this next election becomes crucial, doesn't it, in terms of our planet? It's paramount. Mm -hmm. It really is mm -hmm. because um, we don't ha we're not going to have another eight years. Mm -hmm. That's uh, so, yeah. so um, scary sounding, but, but we need to hear that. We need to have people like you telling us because... Um, we're not noticing it in our day-to-day -day life, like people who get out and go up to the Arctic, down to the um, Antarctic. Yeah. Pull for the planet is coming up for you. Is that still on 
track? Yeah, pulling Tell for us the planet. Uh, pulling for the planet. We're going back to Greenland after 20 years. After I've been gone it's 20, 20 years, now? it's been oh. 20 years already. Gosh. And I'm gonna uh, revisit with some of the old uh, Polar Inuit friends that I've uh, gathered over the years there and find out how their lives have changed over the last 20 years since we were there last. And, uh, They've had to make some big adjustments. They're people of the Arctic, people of the ice and snow, and mm -hmm. uh, climate change affects them d uh, directly. Mm -hmm. um, we're living here at around 45 degrees north latitude, so we don't see the effects like you would see it at the equator or at the North Pole right. as drastically. So that's why we're seeing the biggest changes in Antarctica and in Alaska. Uh, in terms of climate change and what's happening there. But it's happening everywhere and farmers and, right. and fishermen and hunters and, and people like that that are outside a lot, they, they understand that there's a big change as well. Um, so you're going with a team this time, you're not doing this solo, right? No, going, uh, going with a team, uh, Pascal Marceau, uh, a friend of mine and partner, uh, and climb, also climbing partner, uh, we are going to go to Greenland and uh, do some dog sledding to the north, about a 1,500 mile journey, mm. um, uh, to um, uh, go search for a, a kind of a lost supply current that Robert Perry put in place there in oh, really? 1909. Wow. Um, and also uh, uh, relook at some Inuit, old Inuit tent rings that uh, John Holger and I found when we circumnavigated mm. Greenland. And then um, uh, really visit and uh, with the uh, Polar Inuit and our friends there to find out how things have changed for them. And that's another one of your passions, isn't it, really? The, the, the cultural changes going on and, and how we need to learn from them and and yeah, every culture on the planet is a place for us to learn, learn from, and uh, and not be not separate ourselves from, uh, like uh, kind of the avenues we're going, we've been going these days. It's really, I look at those kind of cultures as a way to learn, learn about the simplicity of, with the Inuit people. It's, for me, it's uh, uh, learning how to live with less and how to. Um, be more in tune with um, the world and the planet. And with nature. In, yeah. Maybe when you come back, we'll have you on again and talk about that whole learning um, you know, experience. That I want wonderful. to um, put your books up real quickly here. We're out of time. Alone at the Top is the book that I was reading all this week and told Lonnie that I felt like I was with him on the, the trip. Um, this describes your Denali trip, and this is your latest book, actually, right? Yes, it is. And it's just very well written, and uh, you wrote it with Pam Luwaji? Yeah, from the Star Trek. Right, yeah, yeah. in the Minnesota Historical Press. We did, yes. Published it. And then this wonderful book that is called Life on Ice, and this talks about several of your expeditions. And it's a beautiful book, also very well written also full of scary stories and inspiring stories. And um, so, two, two to check out. Thank you, Mary. Well, thank you so much for thank coming so down. Much. and I really appreciate it. And uh, telling us more about your, your adventures and um, it's very it's motivating. Always, always been a pleasure to come here and, uh, and see how you guys are doing. And thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, I'll be back next week. Until then, have a good week and, and check out Lonnie's website, or I should mention www.lonniedupre.com. So, thank you for being with us. Bye bye.